complete. The old Skype sound. Are you recording this part? <laughs> hey. Hi. Hi, I'm Aaron. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Let me just close the door. And this is my producer, Katie. Hi, Andrew. Hi. She's the one you were tweeting with. Yeah, we were speaking over Twitter. How yeah. are you doing? I'm good, thank you. <laughs> I guess it's morning for you still, is it? Yeah, yeah. bright and early. Drinking well, coffee. Well, it's noon. It's yeah. not that early. So I'm going to be on the other side recording, so it'll just be you and Aaron. But thank you so much for being here with us over the internet. We really appreciate it. I've done quite a few of these podcasts now. I quite like them. and quite enjoyable. Alpaca Pals, you know by now that I've traveled quite a lot, and I'll be the first to admit that my travels haven't always been smooth sailing. There was the time I almost got deported out of Croatia. It was an accident, I swear. And there was the time I lost my passport in Cuba. Oh, and there was the time my bus almost got hit by a landslide in Nepal. So sure, I've had my fair share of close calls, but I'm by no means an extreme traveler. To most, Andrew Drury is just a normal British family guy. He's been married for 10 years, has a couple of children, and goes to work every day from nine to five. He's the director of a construction company. But a couple times a year, Andrew goes on holiday. He doesn't bring his family. In fact, a lot of the time, he doesn't even tell them where he's going. And that's because Andrew is an extreme traveler. On Andrew's holidays, he's met the Ku Klux Klan, been taken hostage, had tea with drug lords. He's even been attacked by the Taliban and huddled on the front line of a battle with ISIS. So Andrew's idea of travel has even gotten him on TV. He appeared in the Netflix show Dark Tourist. He brings the host of the show, David, to Kazakhstan, where they swim in a lake formed by a nuclear blast. So today, we're chatting with Andrew Drury to find out what extreme travel actually is and his experiences doing it. Alpaca Pals, recording for the first 10 minutes of this interview was a little bit wonky because of a bad web connection. So I'm going to recap for you the first few minutes before we dive into chatting with Andrew. So Andrew tells me that as a kid, he went on very normal family vacations. They were fun, but so normal that he found them boring. When he got older, he decided to travel somewhere unusual, because presumably that wouldn't be boring. So he booked a trip to Uganda. The first few days were spent observing wild gorillas. They were great, he says, but also kind of boring, because gorillas don't do really that much. Andrew says that it was by complete chance that he was offered the opportunity to cross the border into what was then called Zaire, which is now known as the Congo. He said yes. Soon afterwards, he found himself in the Congo, being chased by a man who thought that they were stealing. The man was going to kill us, Andrew says. He was well aware of that. And something about that moment changed him. The adrenaline excited him, and he could never go back to boring, simple travel. It's now been 25 years of extreme travel, and Andrew tells me that his motivation to travel to places has shifted. I've built relationships with people, and I return for the people, he says. This is why he's gone to Iraq, to the front lines of ISIS, several times. He tells me about how he spent a day with a sniper on these front lines. The sniper wasn't a sniper because he wanted to be. He was there because he wanted to get home. Every day, he would stare through the lens of his sniper rifle at his house, which had been taken by ISIS. He was waiting for his moment to fight his way back into his home. They spent one day together, but Andrew didn't forget the sniper. 
Now, Andrew says he's heading back there because this front line has been broken down and he needs to know if the sniper is alive and if he got his house back. Yeah, and people say, is it ethical? Um, should, you, should you be doing it? They ask me loads of times, but I don't really care what people think. I don't care about the ethics. I don't do it for other people's reasons apart from mine. But during the, all I know is the time that I've spent with these people, they were pleased from the respite of somebody, um, someone of a different opinion of Arabs, um, someone, of different, someone who was going to spend time when life was falling apart for them, someone that can go back and tell their story, which I've done um, in, in the media. So for, for me, um, it's important. I've affected their lives. I don't care what, what people think about me here. But for them, so yeah, no, I, th- I think it's a good thing. I don't think it's a bad thing. And not only that, we're li- not lied, but we're never told the truth of what's really happening in war zones or in, in these areas. Mm. I mean, I've learned so much from these travels. I was the first person into Mogadishu. Mogadishu still is and was the most dangerous place on earth at the time. Um, and I sponsor a basketball there. I don't know. Do you know much more about Mogadishu? I know a little bit, like the basics. It's famous for the Black Hawk Down film. Yeah. They, I first went there years ago to see if I could find the helicopter because it was still there, and it was still there after the battle for Mogadishu. And during the period of time there, I met this basketball team. It was playing, well, whilst bombs were dropping. That's the emotional tie that I have now. So maybe I do differ from most extreme tourists. And do you, I guess you continue to go back and see them? Yeah, I've been now four or five times wow. um, um, to Mogadishu, and it's not changed. I mean, the, the average month, probably, I don't know, 50, 60 people get killed in that city a month. Yeah. Um, thousands, be, and it's not even reported. You won't even hear about it. Yeah. Because it's not interesting news, but it's interesting to me because they're my friends. Yeah, and you're right. Like, I don't think that there's a lot of coverage of Mogadishu, at least here in Canada. Well, no one really cares. That's yeah. the truth. Yeah, yeah. I actually wanted to dissect the term extreme travel a little bit because that's we we've talked on this podcast before about dark tourism and I know that you were on the show dark tourists so they were framing your type of travel as that as dark tourism but I feel like what you're doing isn't really that like dark tourism seems very accessible I know that I've been a dark tourist there's sort of like a (laughs) there seems to be more of um I don't know. Well, like... Someone died in the background or something. So I, I missed something around the corner. Pretty close. <laughs> <Something happened. laughs> um, it seems like there's more of an adrenaline element to the type of tourism that you're doing. Because yeah, you go into well, it like knowing yeah. that there's risk to your life to a degree, whereas like the average dark tourist isn't risking their life. See, I don't even believe much in the term of dark tourism. I think all of us are dark. I think most people... With the opportunity, I mean, even television shows the dark side. So I don't, I don't even understand the term dark tourist. I mean, if you look at, I, I, I don't understand it. I think it's just historical places to visit. I mean, Chernobyl, for instance, it's now mainstream HBO I've got TV series, so most people have got a morbid curiosity. I don't know, I don't know the term of dark tourist. I certainly don't fit it. Mm-hmm. Um, David chose me because of my extreme, and I suppose I'm classed as the most extreme traveller probably out there I don't think there's anybody more extreme and for the length of time we're doing it I mean like we've talked about dark tourism on this podcast about like from the angle of it being associated with sites that are associated with mass deaths and that seems to be the way that people seem to be at a consensus for so like if you go and visit Auschwitz that's dark tourism which doesn't seem similar at all to what you're doing no but then if you go to I think touring, I mean, did you go to the dark tourist sites because you wanted to experience it or you had an interest? I went because I had an interest in the history, personally, but I know that not everyone is motivated by that same reason. I know what you mean. I mean, oh yeah, I've got a lot of golf followers you get now because of being on, <laughs> doing, doing the dark tourist. Um, yeah, I've been uh, a load of weirdos and college students contacting me regular, <laughs> <laughs> thinking... I'm sort of wanting to have near death. I don't want to die. They, yeah. These college students seem to think that they got someone who's close to death yeah. for some reason. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, have there been mo- like, do you go on these trips conscious of the fact that you might not come back? Do you ever think about that? Um, uh, I would lie. Um, I, I'm so well organized. The trips that I do, I mean, the planning is, you wouldn't believe how much planning I do. 
Um, like, for instance, if I was in Iraq, I will know the way back to the airport wherever I am. I know my places to safety. I have certain things I do in hotels. If I'm in an extreme zone, like probably Mogadishu or Yemen or somewhere like that, I'll choose only hotel rooms with a window and exit. So I do think of it on an aeroplane when I kiss kids goodbye, I always think, have I gone too far? Um, so it's always conscious. But when I, that's here in the UK or that'd be on an aeroplane. But as soon as I land or wherever I am, they tend to fade away for a bit. Mm. Apart from when I, we thought we got taken hostage. Uh, <laughs> that was a different time. Um, we got locked up for 24 hours, myself and my cousin. And we thought that was it. We were going to be taken somewhere um, into southern Iraq and end up being locked up for a few years and maybe even losing our life. But it never happened. But yeah. I really don't know what happened even that day. Someone, a lorry come and got us with military-style troops and dropped us in a town and bought us a kebab. So I still don't know what that's all about. Yeah, I was going to ask you, because I was telling Katie, if if my partner was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to Iraq, even if he was like, I've well planned it, don't worry. If we had hypothetical children, I would be pissed. I would be like, no way. You well, can't do we this. we have got hypothetical children. We've got You've got real, real children. children. Yeah. Um, I feel guilty um, constantly because I'm a real soft dad. I, I mean, I love my kids. Most people are surprised when they speak to me. They expect me to be some sort of tattooed, big beard, um, rough or stupid person. But, but I'm not. I'm a real soft father. My kids mean the world to me. But I believe that we all have our life passage. My wife, um, when I travel, she never used to know, really. She's not really worldly, didn't really care. Um, but just recently... As soon as I come back to Iraq and the publicity I got hit, I was on most news interviews. I was on most news interviews from, in Germany, France, everybody else, because the Iraq attack, she now is not, makes it harder and harder for me to travel. She um, asked more questions than she's ever asked before. Mm. She's made me feel more guilty, but she hasn't never stopped me doing it, but I feel more guilty than I ever have done. Do you think at a certain point you might choose to stop? For the sake of your family, uh, or if I'm truthful, I've come to the stage in my life. I've done so much um, frontline and tours. I kind of there's not much more I can do. So I've got I'm going to focus my trips on other things which are planned now. So they're just as extreme, but not onto frontline stuff. So I'm changing my try not this year. The, this year's still basically frontline. I've got some real extreme trips this year, but next year. I'm changing what I do. Mm. Not because of the fear, I'm just a bit bored of it. <laughs> yeah, how are you changing it? Um, well, I've, got, I've always had this obsession for prisons. And around Africa and the Middle East, I've got some real extreme prisons. And I went to the worst in, in um, Somalia, central Mogadishu. Um, it was, it's a horrendous prison. And it kind of takes you to the real extreme of life, of what people end up and how they... You know, I, I saw a little boy um, that I'm trying to campaign for. He was the age of 10. And the reason he was in prison in Somalia is because his parents found him too hard to deal with. So he was sharing a prison with 20 and 30 year old adults and men. And I saw him in prison on his own. And I was trying to find a way of getting him out. So I've been trying to deal with the prison to, so that I can buy them electrical and stuff so they can release this boy, but he's gone now, so so, so my cause. But that's a, a, a story that's quite regular in Somalia. They lock children up just for being naughty, mm. and not many people report it or know about it. So you're focusing so, more on like helping locals and putting efforts towards improving things for locals in the countries that you, you visited? You know, I, hate, I hate that. That's true, yeah, I suppose so, but because it's not been what I have been about. For 20 years, I haven't been about that, but for the last three or four years, I have. I think when I go there, I owe it to the people, rather than just, which I used to do, I used to just be in a bubble and um, come back and just visit and clear off and didn't really care about anybody's feelings. But just recently, and the last few years, I really care about the people. Yeah. Um, and I feel I owe it to them, because I feel I am a bit of a voyeurist. I think I owe it to them to maybe go back and see if I can do something for them or help. Yeah. I mean, so I wanted to bring up the fact that like there is definitely an, like an element of power play here where like you have the means to choose to go to a war zone 
spend money on the logistics, have people protect you. And is yeah. it because of that that you feel now that you have this, that you should be giving back to the community yeah. in a way? I don't think it's been a conscious effort. It's just happened. I don't think it's been, con I just, me as a person's changed. So it's not the fact is, I've all of a sudden thought that I've done all this to these people. I just feel, I, f I think that if I, if I continue my journeys like I, I have been, I would have felt, yeah, maybe you're right with you. And I'll just go like, probably be abusing the people I've met. Um, I've been doing what I've been accused of for the last 25 years, yeah. would be true. And do you ever think about the fact that like these travels do require local people to put their lives on the line for your... Yeah, that's, I, I've been asked that so many, so many times by I people. Bet. And it's, it's a good question. Of course it is. But these people that I travel with, their lives on the line anyway in most areas. The guy in Nur in downtown Mogadishu that I visit, and he's my friend, he lives in downtown Mogadishu. And his life expectancy every time he gets up in the morning is probably... He's probably got a 70, 80, 90% chance of living that day. So his life's at risk anyway. So I would imagine that he would think, as I'm prepared to put my list was at life at risk with him, it might gives him, it gives him a better feeling about his life. Mm. So in that case, no. And, and some of the um, people, the guides and the people I have, they guide the media, they guide the press. That's their job. They choose to do it. I don't go and find some stray guy in the street and say, well, you take me to a front line. That is what they're doing anyway. They don't just do it for me. They do it for media and everybody else. Right. Different between media. Media give me a hard time, but media are more voyeuristic or more uncaring than I have. I mean, I've been to places where CNN have been, um, ABC News have been out and they've had reporters there. They do not care about any of the people. They do their half an hour, hour, hour shoot in front of the camera. They're off into a safe hotel and leave. They don't spend any time with the general public. And they're the people that uh, give me the hardest time. Mm. But equally, they give me the hardest time, but then ring me or contact me for my contacts. So it, it is probably partly true. Because yeah. they weren't out with me on the front line that day. And, and I got killed. They could get killed with me. But they are doing it. Yeah. I also wanted to ask you about, I was reading that one of the companies you've worked with is called Untamed Borders. So I read a, actually a CNN article. Um, the founder of this company, James Wilcox, argues it's that- my mate. Is he? <laughs> yeah, he's my mate. Yeah, he's a really, really good mate. I was speaking to him this week, James. Yeah. Is he British? Yeah. Yeah, he lives in Holland, but he's English, yeah. Oh, okay. It's funny because, so I was browsing their website and I saw a trip to Northeast India and like next thing I knew, I was emailing them, being like, "Can you tell me about I've this been there. trip?" <laughs> where, where did you, um, I went to Nagaland. Yeah, um, we want to go there. there. Went about ten years ago, um, and then went out with a group of monkey hunters, stayed in the forest. Yeah, yeah, he does that. It's a great trip, and he's a great guy. The good thing about him, that trek. Did you want to go to Nagaland then? Yeah. That trek to Nagaland is difficult and without the right sort of transport guides and connections you would find it difficult so you couldn't really to orienteer it's difficult but it's a fantastic place to watch yeah. to, to visit sorry yeah, really yeah. great they've got the king of the headhunters there it's a bit touristy now though we've been to other parts of india so now we there's just we really love india and we wanted to branch out into an area that we hadn't been to and that's a little less touristy compared to the rest it is it honestly, it's it's a great experience. Yeah. Because you're on the Burmese border. I crossed into Burma illegally again, but yeah, it it is a phenomenal trip. Oh, you've crossed in. What part of Burma were you in? Uh, it was um, in Nag at the Nagaland northwest tip of Nagaland. I don't know. You know the area. It's just an area of in Burma. There, the border yeah. lines there. It's um, got troops on the border. We waited at night until the troops didn't really give a monkeys and just crossed the border with some locals. Huh. We've been to Burma as well, but we were like on the tourist trail there, so we didn't see any of the borders or any of that. So you are quite extreme yourself. I mean, people think, I mean, yeah, like my parents think that I'm extreme, but I, I know people like you, and so I don't feel that I'm extreme at all. But I was criticized when I went to Myanmar. People said, why are you going to this country where you're potentially supporting a genocide with your tourism dollars? And that's something that I've really grappled with afterwards. Did that bother you? Did that, bother you? Did that upset you that people it, said that? It did, yeah. 
Yeah. But my advice to you is don't pay attention. Just go for your own feelings. It doesn't matter what other people think yeah. or other people's opinions. It matters what you're doing it for, not yeah. what people think. And your money, um, they think that you were contributing to mass genocide by taking a few dollars there. It was also interesting because a lot of people, while I was going there, were concerned for my safety. And then I'm sure, as you know, once I was there, it was totally fine. Like, it's not this war-torn no. country that people believe it to be. No, it's they're, they're lovely people. Yeah. Um, more, the, the only person that's threatened me with a gun, well, no, that's not true, because I've, I've been shot at, so that's more of a threat. But somebody who actually spoke to me with a gun in their hand was in America. Um, the Ku Klux Klan leader said he was going to shoot me, <laughs> or would shoot me, because I sold a story on him, and he said, if I ever come back, um, he would find me and kill me. If you went back to the U.S.? Uh, in, in his area. I mean, he's a stupid little man, so it was a stupid little comment. <laughs> uh, so, but I have been, I have been inciting him recently yeah. to upset him. Because I'm not very clean on the Ku Klux Klan, as you can imagine. If you travel, you, if you can't be a true traveller if you're racist. And these group of people are so stupid, it's unbelievable. I managed, I, how I got managed to spend two days with them, I do not know. If they did their research, they would never have let me meet them. Yeah. So just to back it up a little bit, the question I had about Untamed Borders was, and it oh. actually ties into this issue of like where your tourism yep. dollars go. Do you know what they do to make sure, like if they're going to Afghanistan, do they take measures to control where the funds go? James is the most ethical man that you'll ever meet and one of the most intelligent guys you'll meet. Everything he does in any country... Um, that he goes to is well researched. I try and push him to travel. Um, I try to push him to extremes. If you see my video, um, the part of my video on the Netflix was um, was me on the front line in Iraq. They showed a little bit of that, and he was videoing and he was with me. But he wasn't a tour guide. He was my friend at that time, so he's very conscious of everything. He, he's try he helps tries to help their economy by building like like their ski in Iraq. They've got like a, trying to start ski villages and skiing in Iraq. And he's right behind that. He tries to encourage people to visit there. Um, in Afghanistan, he puts a lot of money into women's marriage and marathons. So he's, he's trying to deal with that. So he's socially, totally socially aware. He's one of the nicest guys you'll meet. Mm. And people knock him because they believe that he, he allows people to take risk in their travel. His travels are so well organized and so well researched. If you go with him, you're so safe. Um, okay, that actually brings up another question. So I've noticed in my experience, like as a traveler, for a lot of my life, I traveled by myself. I travel yeah. now with my partner, which is great um, yeah. and adds a layer of security for me. But when I was traveling alone, like people were really judgmental of the fact that I was traveling alone as a woman. And yeah. I've always felt sort of restricted by that. Whereas a lot of the men that I've met traveling feel a lot safer and like they have more freedom in the way that they move around the world as a tourist. And have you, so I'm curious if you've encountered women who are as extreme as you are. I, I, I've got to be honest, I haven't met anybody as extreme. There's only one woman, yes. Eleonora, she's an Italian woman. She's married to an American. She's very extreme, but she doesn't travel on her own. So that's not the case. I think also, if you travel in the Middle East, um, you've got the religious aspects of being a woman. Maybe that's subconscious. In India, not, not at all, I don't think you haven't, they're used, so used to it. I, th I think you're probably true, but maybe it's psychological in your mind. I don't think you're at any more risk, probably less risk, hmm. unless it's in the Middle East. I mean, in India, I felt at great risk by myself, comparatively well, to my partner. Whereabouts? Uh, all over, like we were mostly in the center. We traveled from Kolkata all the way across to Rajasthan and then south. It's a lovely trip. Yeah. What what what, what did you think was the risk of? It's not that I felt that something would happen to me. It was just that I was constantly a spectacle. Like everywhere I walked, people were staring, and if my partner left at all, I was surrounded by men. It's not that I really felt something would happen to me. It was just like, I can't move through this country without being noticed. And that made me uncomfortable to a degree. Yeah. I, can't, I kind of have that feeling in Iraq because I'm white as white. I mean, my face goes red as soon as the sun comes out. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you, I think that's also psych, psychological. 
because I, I mean, I feel the same as a man because of my colour. Um, in the Middle East, you are. So I don't think it's just being a woman. I think in the work. I don't. I don't. I haven't. It wasn't on your trip with you in India, um, but I, I would have thought India would be the least. Um, but maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, and I mean, the, the, and the thing is, it's it's little things that you notice. Like if we were hiring a rickshaw and I'm trying yeah. to barter for the rickshaw, they'll never barter with sense. me. It's always well, it's always my partner. They only want to talk to the man, and I get that that's a cultural thing. But as a woman traveler, it adds a layer of complexity to your experience, where it's harder if you're alone to navigate these places because people don't view you in the same way that they would it's a true. man. In that case, if you felt uncomfortable, don't go to Pakistan or Afghanistan or Iraq or Syria. <laughs> I don't I think I will. You don't intend to. I don't intend to. I have been to the Middle East, though, and I had wonderful really experiences. Been. I've been to Jordan, Dubai. Well, I'm in Iraq in September, if you fancy meeting up in Istanbul. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been to Istanbul, actually. <laughs> I think Nagaland is next for us. We're really keen on that. But Nagaland is a special trip. Yeah. And it's important now because the guys that actually took the heads, the headhunters, they're dying out. I don't even know how many's left because, as you know, they tattoo their self, their faces. Mm. If you look on my Twitter, you can find a picture with me with them. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of 10 years ago. They were in their 70s and 80s. Oh. So then, so I don't know if there's many of them left. But the heads are still there. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so in what ways do you think your travel has shaped your worldview, if at all? A lot. I'm really compassionate, um, caring. I was, I mean, if I, I was born in a white predominant family, in a white predominant country with no, growing up in the 1970s and 80s, had no foreigners living in the country, hardly at all apart from London. So I grew up with a family that would be deemed as now as being racist. They weren't, they were lovely people but they would have feared or not liked anybody outside. And I grew up in the 1780s with the same fear or the same concern about foreigners coming into my country, um, thoughts about black people not being as intelligent as white people, um, all these sort of stereotypical things that people believe. My travel has taught me that the white people are pretty well stupid most of the times. Um, family and social awareness of most people I've met abroad have been more, better than ours. So it's totally changed my thoughts about the world. I also n know and understand how the news and media feed us with lies and untruths that we actually believe are facts. Um, we watch the news and it's only a snippet of what it really is happening. Um, the fears and worries about some things that I've seen that people and the country, I think we're hidden a lot. I think we're protected a lot throughout, throughout our lives. Um, so I've learned not to listen or believe or anything anybody says until you see it yourself. I'm lucky enough to be able to have done that. And I think I've become a nicer person, more compassionate. And so like, it sounds like what you're saying is you've kind of realized, I know for me, a lot of my travel has reminded me of the privilege that I grew up in to have grown up in Canada in a well-to-do family and have had access to education yeah. and to have the means to travel. And it's really brought that to light for me personally in a way that I never experienced in my home life in Canada. I would agree because sitting, um, I go back to this front line, but sitting in a hole dug in the middle of nowhere with a guy that never can shoot a gun, that learned to become a sniper. And you imagine looking for two years in your house for the sight of a sniper rifle and watching ISIS with your family, your home, your friends, and nothing you can do about it apart from try and get it back. And the guy said to me, um, the helicopter gunship, the, a couple of hours before I got there, blown up his village. And he said to me, he hopes his family had been killed. Um, and I, I said, how can you say that? He said, because what ISIS will be doing to them would be much worse. So most of us, and if you, like you're saying, the empathy, and if you have that story and you're there and you're feeling it, you realize how privileged you are. I mean, for me, that's a phenomenal or, or he was able to share that with me. And if I was a normal guy that didn't travel so much, just went to Spain every time of year, my life or how I've, how I've gone about my life wouldn't have changed at all. It would have been a normal, selfish man. So, yeah, of course, it's been a big influence in my life. Do you think that in the future you'll find ways to include your children in this? 
Do you want it? No. Well, I mean, I mean, like, I think when we have a child, we want to bring that child around the world, not to extreme places, but like expose them to the world. No, no, expose them to the world, but not extreme. Yeah. No, they can live through my stories. I've got a book deal. I'm writing a book. They can read that. (laughs) I've been lucky. What I've experienced of what I've done and how I'm still here, I don't know, but I'm here. And they've got to make their own life journey. Yeah. They can make their decisions, but I hope they don't follow mine. My course, I really do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what's on the like extreme horizon for you? Are there any new destinations that you're hoping to go to? Um, two I can't tell you about because of media reasons. Um, there's things happening that I can't tell you about. Um, you can guess. I'm going to the Yemen. Yeah. Um, and one that's probably more extreme than I've ever done. Um, I can tell you about it because no one will know. Do you know much about Kandahar? Yeah. Um, Kandahar and Helmand, I've got a contact who's willing to give me a day in Kandahar, which is scaring me to death, but it's also thrilling. Mm. Um, And I'm also going to be going to Raqqa. It's pretty much cleared out, but dangerous. Yeah, it's so quite extreme. You're welcome to come on them if you want. <laughs> Bring your partner, see if he wants to come. <laughs> I'll ask him. I have a feeling it'll be no. <laughs> oh, yeah. How how do, logistics-wise, how do you get the papers, like the visas, to enter these countries? Um, some you don't. Um, going into Syria, um, you can tra- travel through Syria through Iraq. Um, the Turkish don't like it much, but they don't care. They throw you out. Some you do, some you don't. Um, I barter and bribe at borders. Um, in some countries, some people take money and let you in. Um, and basically, it's contacts on ground. Um, even if a tourist is not allowed into, say, the Yemen, there's people that you know through your circuit. Um, I use um, media passes and press passes um, by lying, um, and any means I can. There's always a way to get in when there's money. Have you been denied entry ever to a country you were trying to get into? Uh, yeah, I got. Um, I was traveling through Iraq first time during the that been late nineties um, when we was under conflict, um, and I entered the country through um, through Turkey um, up into northern Iraq. And when I got in, American CIA. This seems like it's it's true. CIA representatives from the Americans met us in our hotel and said that the locals were aware we were here, the Taliban knew we were here. They put a $100,000 price tag on our head, myself and my cousin, told us to leave the country because, you know, leave our hotel at night, which we did. Mm. We went to Erbil, which was then under threat, and the hotel got blown up when we were there. Um, We then tried to escape through um, Iran, but they refused us entry for Iran. So we'd made it up into the mountains and got through a truck stop, and they wouldn't let us in. Um, We had, having a price tag on our head, then a vehicle come and took us and locked us away for the 24 hours I was talking about. And then we had to get back. We had nowhere to go. We was in, stuck in Iraq with people wanting to take us. So we had to get back out of Iraq, right through the country again, with no means of transport, through Turkey, and then back into Iran to our flight home. So, yeah, we got refused to get into Iran um, from Iraq. And then I managed, luckily, to get from Turkey into Iran mm. through the mountains. So yeah, I've been refused. So does it freak you out when things don't go according to plan and you have to come up with these alternative plans? <laughs> or is that part of out. the thrill? Is that like, oh, this is great. Now I have a challenge. <laughs> well, it, no. <laughs> I'd rather not have had the challenge. I'd rather they let me through. Um, because it was a lot of two days stuck in a truck with and taxis and people that you weren't too sure that wanted to kill you or then your mind starts working you know is this taxi driver going to take me somewhere I don't want to go and mm. but I've got to use him because I've got to get out so no I wasn't thrilled I was pissed off I wanted to get out straight away um but no no when it, but it, it when you come back you've got a story to tell haven't you yeah. I suppose yeah how connected to your family are you when you're traveling oh that was another problem when I got, I, I, I contacted my wife when I couldn't get into Iran. I said, look, I'm in trouble. Um, I can't get in. I'll give you a call back in a few hours. 
during that few hours we've been taken away, our phones have been taken away and been locked up. Um, so I didn't speak to her for 24 hours that time. And then I thought I was going to give her a ring as soon as I get back. She'd be panicking. Um, then I couldn't read her because I mean, they cut the mobile phone signals off sometimes because it's in a war zone. Yeah. So I didn't ring her for three days. And she didn't talk to me for about three weeks. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I paid the price. Uh, Does she... But- like, do you have a system in place if she doesn't hear from you for like a certain amount of time? Will she call authorities or try to figure out where you are? Um, I've never allowed her to know. She, my, my wife isn't worldly about travel or world or risk or anything. She's not interested. So I always lead her to believe there's not a problem before I go because I don't want her to worry. Um, but just I suppose now it's a bit different. Um, no, there is no plan. That's the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ring you next time. I've got your number. <laughs> yeah, I'll do my best. I'll ask Canada to come. Well, I have got my family living in Canada, so. Oh, really? Yeah, you're gonna have to. Got got kinship with you. <laughs> well, there's some extreme places up north in Canada you could check out. They're not war zones, but there's polar bears. Oh yeah, they they they, they like hunting humans, don't they? Yeah, they're bears? very dangerous. They're very dangerous. Yeah. It's too cold. <laughs> yeah my brother my brother's in the military and he has to go up far far north sometimes and um he has to be with two locals at all times who have rifles in case there's a polar bear and he's gotten caught in like whiteouts where he's just like huddled in the snow waiting hopefully like the snow will clear Wait, and then, <laughs> like I, it's crazy it's really another world up there so you're writing a book. When can we expect to to get our uh, hands on so that? I'm a bit lazy um, <laughs> about writing it. I've got a deal, but I want to. When I go back in September to Iraq, I can. I feel like I've finished that part of the chapter that I'm on now because I want to write. Um, it's on. I, I saw them at war, and now I want to see the effects of war because nobody, no journalist or no media. They go to front lines, they say how bad it is, or but they never return back to tell the story of what happened afterwards. Mm. And I think it's important in my book, or my means of travel, that I tell all the stories, like I have in Somalia, like I have in um, most of the countries, I've gone back and told that story towards the end. Mm. I don't wanna do that. I've got to do the same in Syria. I've got a couple of stories to tell there. Mm. Um, so I'll return back there as well. So maybe that's when my book will come out, maybe mm. next year, when I can actually be bothered to finish it. See, I'm not narcissistic. I'm not concerned. I mean, I didn't go on to Dark Tourist. It was only because they asked me. They haven't asked about that yet, though. I'm surprised that everybody wants to ask about the Polygon. I'm glad you've asked about none that, but you can if you want <laughs> Well, to I just speak. figured you've talked about it so much, so why not talk about other things? I mean, I'm mm. sure you've talked about all these things, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, that is an intro. It was. Did you watch the Polygon? Did you watch the Kazakhstan? Yeah, and actually, I'll be honest with you, I don't really like that show very much. There's a lot of people who have said that to me. Yeah, um, I thought it was shit. It, <laughs> okay. Your episode um, was great, but it, overall, you've got to say shit that, show. I'm sitting here with you. Well, like I thought it was interesting. I just felt that there were discussions that could have happened to make the show more interesting. Like he doesn't really delve into maybe the ethics is what I'm thinking. Like I don't know. I just something about the tone of the show didn't sit well with me. Maybe because you're maybe because you do um, extreme tourism yourself maybe have your own thoughts and reflection on it. Yeah. I kind of don't look too deep into my side of it. I'm very different to everybody else that was on it. Um, for me, I don't want to say anything about David because he's a very nice guy and the show I enjoyed doing, so I've only got positivity. Also, I mean, I went to the orphanage at the end and I still, if I, if you spoke to me too long, I'll be crying now. So I can't talk too much about the orphanage. I'm still in contact with them. So once again, that's another journey that's not finished with me. Like, um, we did a great filming session there. We saw, maybe brought to attention what the Russians have been doing and what they're probably still doing now. Um, but that's another story that's not ended because I met some children there and met some situations. Like, media don't generally go back. And I dare say dark tourists would never go back if it's recommissioned. Mm. Um, but I got to because my conscience is something in my head's telling me to go back. I've got no reason to go back. Just the fact is... I promise to go back at some stage. Mm. So I think that's probably how I've changed. Maybe that's what, how I'm different to people. But I am making a movie, though. Oh, really? make, I can tell you that. Okay. I'm making a, uh, a movie 
um, a cinema documentary movie um, called Danger Zone. Um, so that will be out, and I'm filming start some of that this year. Okay. So that will be out sometime, isn't it? Exclusive for you. Yeah. That'll be in cinemas. Cool. Um, I wanted to tell you, when you were talking about your book, I was thinking of one reporter that I know. His name is Joe Sacco. Have you heard of this guy? So he, he's a reporter. I think he's American, but he is an artist on the side and he created uh, books. I do know him. Yeah. I do know. And it just made me think of him because you were saying like, oh, they come out and they don't really share any like real stories. And he's the only reporter I know of who does that. His books are incredible. That's fantastic. Is he the artist? Yeah. So they're all yeah, illustrated. I think yeah. Yeah. I think it's a shame that people don't. I think the media... Um, I think they are, I think they owe the greatest sin um, because they are raping and pillaging villages and people with cameras and interviewing small children and it looks really good on camera this little starving child mm. or this village that's been blown up they don't do the media do nothing about it mm. it's just a way of reporting for, for viewers and voyeuristic delight mm. I actually think they're the sinners not, yeah. not myself yeah I agree with you like we when we were in Mumbai, I'm sure you know there's like a British movie actually where they talk about this. Like it takes place in a slum in Mumbai. Is that Slum Dog Millionaire? Yeah. So that's like a real slum, and it became kind of famous afterwards because of yeah. being in this movie. And in Mumbai, they run tours to the slum. And my partner and I were like, well, that's kind of fucked. We're not going to go on a tour, we'll just go on our own. Because we exactly, were curious. Yeah. And you see all these images of the slum. And then we got there. It's just a normal neighborhood. People are living their lives. Yes, they're impoverished. But it wasn't this, like, exploitative image of, like, a slum that you see in the media. It was really interesting. But th there you go. Exactly. Fake news. And I'll oh, sound like Donald Trump now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but it is fake news, isn't it? it yeah. It is. It's just a load of crap. It's... That's why that's why traveling is really important. Is that's why podcasts like yourself, um, social media, it gives people a chance to get the true side of um, what life is really about. Mm -hmm. And and hopefully newspapers will stop selling in the end. And people like our BBC and uh, online Daily Mail crap they put out yeah. can can be ended by people's true thoughts. Because I'll tell you the truth. I've got no religious or political view. Just my view. Yeah. All right. Well. That's all my questions. Thanks so much. I've enjoyed speaking to you. Oh, thank this has been you. more serious than I normally have. Um, I'm surprised you have the interest to want to invite us. Or I might give you a call when I'm in um, Iraq. I'll give you a ring live. Okay, you that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. In Iraq, I'll give you one. I'd be happy to do that if you wanted to. Yeah, let's do it. That'd be fun. Thanks very much for inviting me. And thank you behind the corner, or whoever, wherever you are. Thanks for inviting <laughs> thank me. You thank you so you. much, Andrew. It's been such a pleasure meeting you. Thank you, same here. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye. 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 Oh, uh, I like kind of like him. Me too. <laughs> I mean, he's just a regular guy is my first thought. And okay, this is, I was probably wrong in assuming that I wouldn't like him. I have mixed feelings and that is because I do like Andrew. And I think that he is receptive to criticism. He's clearly aware that there are people who disagree with what he is doing, and he doesn't seem interested in arguing with anyone about it, which I really appreciate. Um, and I think in a way, it's a great approach to really anything in life because the reality is people will always find something to criticize. Yeah, so I didn't get the feeling that he is completely unwilling to think critically about his actions and honestly it's not fair but I thought that he would be I thought that he would be like very ignorant which wasn't fair <laughs> um, in retrospect I wish that I had challenged him more in this conversation because I'm curious to know what his responses would be to some of my thoughts and this is where like it's a personal struggle like interviewing can be really difficult in this sense and this interview didn't go at all how I imagined it would. And honestly, I kind of like got in my own head for this interview. 
because I thought that he would be very challenging. Yeah, so that's honestly a bit of a regret. Like, I wish I had been more difficult. (sighs) I don't know. Yeah, like, for example, I think it's a bit problematic that he feels the need to now give back to the communities he's visited. I wonder if that is a result of guilt that maybe he feels for entering these communities in the way that he does. And I also think it points a bit towards the white savior complex. I think I would feel differently if that had always been part of the way that he traveled, but it seems like it's sort of an afterthought now. Like maybe he's gotten older and he's matured and he's realized, okay, like I took something from these communities and now I have a, now I owe it to them to give back. Another thing that is bothering me, I guess, is this concept of using travel to understand our own privilege. When I reflect now on our conversation about visiting the slum in Mumbai, I kind of disagree with myself. Like listening to that back, I was kind of grossed out by what I said. And I think that it's maybe problematic that I need to see a slum to understand my own privilege. In fact, I know that that is problematic um, because there are non-exploitative ways to consider and learn our own privilege. Um, This is something that I'm grappling with. And I think that it's a bit of a white thing. And by white, I mean the inherent privilege and position of power that white people experience, which is a result of systemic racism, but also a long, long legacy of colonialism around the world. I don't think it's intentional in most cases, but travelers often end up participating in poverty tourism because it can make them feel enlightened or to feel like they understand the world differently because they've seen poverty. I think that I personally need to be better at self-examining when I travel, Um, so questioning my own motivations for the actions I take abroad, and I think like that slum is a good example of this. The other thing I found interesting about Andrew is his obsession, maybe not obsession, but how he like thinks that what he's doing is about truth finding. He seems to like believe that truth finding substantiates his love of extreme travel. It's obvious that he really disagrees with the way that the media portrays foreign countries and conflict abroad. And I actually fully agree that foreign portrayal in the media is a problem and it contributes to dangerous stereotypes. Um, I think it would be great, though, to see what Andrew does with this truth finding knowledge, because to me, it's like, what's the point of uncovering it if it isn't shared? Like just that's like a lot to go through to to just find truth for yourself. Um, So we'll see. Maybe this book and this documentary that he's working on will delve into this and maybe... Maybe the point of those will be in service of this truth-finding goal that he seems to have. All in all, this conversation with Andrew, I thought I would judge him a lot, but really I'm just judging myself now. Like, I think I it's just made me think more about what I do when I travel and, like, the implications of that. It's really interesting. I have a feeling that our conversations with Andrew are maybe not over and that (laughs) we might talk to him again because I have more. I almost have more questions now. And I think now that I've spoken with him once, I would be more comfortable being a little more aggressive talking to him, not aggressive, but just like own the conversation a bit more than I did this time around. So we'll see. So Alpaca Pals, let us know what you thought about this conversation with Andrew. We're really curious. Um, Has it made you think about what he does or are you thinking more about your own travels? Um, Yeah, tweet us, DM us, you know, you know how to reach us. If you want to get in touch with Andrew Drury, you can find him on Twitter. He's at Andrew Drury. 
shoot him a tweet because he's super responsive and down to chat about extreme travel. If you dig us, please review the podcast and remember to subscribe while you're at it and tune in every other Wednesday for more episodes. I hope you all get to alpaca your bags soon. Until next time. Did you get those? Yeah.